What's up guys? Today's video is going to be one of the panels that I moderated at DragonCon this past year. It is our episode 9 speculation panel, and Molly was also on it with me, along with Charlotte and Caitlin from the Sky Talkers podcast, and Thomas Harper from The Legal Geeks. Now we did film the panel, but it was just not looking great, because it was a really wide shot uh, with all of us at the table, and we only had the one camera, and uh, it just doesn't look all that great. So instead, I put up the slideshow that we used, and uh, basically you can just treat this as an hour-long audio podcast about all of us talking about episode 9 and what we hope to see, what we think might happen, all that good stuff. So I uh, hope you enjoy it. Welcome to episode 9 Speculation! <laughs> We have a lot to talk about, especially after last weekend, so we're just going to get right to it. Uh, let's go down the line and introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Alex Damon. I run a YouTube channel called Star Wars Explained. Yeah. I am Molly Damon, and I also run the YouTube channel. <laughs> I'm Thomas Harper. I do not run the YouTube channel Star Wars Explained. <laughs> But I do blog and podcast for a site called The Legal Geeks, and you may have seen us do a mock court martial of Poe Dameron at San Diego Comic Con last year. So cool. He was guilty. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin Plusher, and I'm one of the co hosts of Sky Talkers Podcast. Um, I'm Charlotte Airdy, and I'm the other co host of Sky Talkers Podcast. <laughs> So real quick, uh, we're going to keep this mostly spoiler free. We're going to talk about just stuff that has been officially released. I know there's been a lot of hubbub on Reddit recently. Um, if you are, we're not going to talk about any of that stuff, and we'd appreciate it for the Q&A section if you didn't say, like, on Reddit, I read this thing, because not everyone wants to know that. But let's just get into it. Well, I wanted to start by just talking about the title, The Rise of Skywalker, and what it might mean. Um, let's start down with Charlotte. Oh, man. Um, I think Caitlin should be here. <laughs> yeah. The title, um, so we heard it at Celebration, obviously, is when the title was released. And the rise of Skywalker, I think, one, I don't think I expected Skywalker to even be in the title. But it makes so much sense, because now we're at the end of this nine-part saga that, at its core, is about the Skywalker family. This is the last chapter. It makes sense for Skywalker to be in the title. The one thing I think is really interesting is the word rise, though, because if you look at like the three ending films, like we have Revenge of the Sith, we have Return of the Jedi, and then we have Rise of Skywalker, it like creates this nice flow, um, I think. So you go from Revenge to Return and then to Rise, where at the end, for me, it indicates a happy ending because um, we're on the upswing. <laughs> yeah, I like the idea that uh, and this is something that people have thrown around, that the Skywalkers could be a new line of some kind of Force user, and I, I think that kind of the way you talked about that works together with the three trilogies that we have. Uh, the first one is about how the Skywalker line started, or at least Anakin's part of it, uh, and then it's about his fall, and then the original trilogy is about the Skywalkers' redemption, and then the sequel trilogy is kind of about their legacy. That's the way I'm seeing it. Yeah, I, I like to look at that second lesson that Ray, that Luke taught Ray in The Last Jedi, right? So his, that lesson in a nutshell is the hubris of the Jedi caused them to fail. And in that, as an extension, Luke failed when he attempted to start this new Jedi Order. And immediately, uh, you know, some of his, one of his best students, if not the best student, turned to the dark side, uh, which caused him to, to go into recluse. And so, you know, the Skywalker name, the legacy, at least as far as Luke is concerned, is is really a cast off at the end of The Last Jedi. Well, not at the end, but but as Rey finds Luke on Acto. And so I like to think of this not necessarily as a, a rise of, of Luke's legacy, but of the name. And certainly we've seen in the Star Wars universe, not in the films, but Skywalker isn't just a word that's used as a family name, right? The Chiss use it to describe Force users and so it's not a stretch to think that Ray or whoever could, could see this name as the embodiment of the next generation. Well, let's get into some characters and talk about the state of the resistance, because last we saw them, they were looking pretty rough. <laughs> um, I know that Thomas is very excited about this shot alone. I, I want you to look very closely, and I will tell you, I've already counted this. 
Uh, I, if you don't know me, if you don't interact with me on Twitter or anything, then I will enlighten you that I'm a big fan of the BTL A4 Y Wing uh, as the best starfighter in the universe. And if you look closely, Y Wings represent 26% of that starfighter. <laughs> the Y Wing, I'm here to tell you, is coming to save the day again. I think that's just more a sign that you know they're in bad shape. <laughs> <laughs> So, Ray, we got to start with Ray. She's the main character. Um, and we can't talk about that Ray without that Ray. <laughs> so, I don't know who wants to start. I mean, do you want to? <laughs> Ray. Dark Ray. Yeah. <laughs> Is she a clone? No. Does, no. does this actually happen? Is this a dream? Is it a vision? I don't know. What do you think? Um, I'm going vision. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my take. <laughs> I'm not think? sure. I'm not sure. I, I can see it being a vision. I almost kind of think it's some sort of Palpatine possession. But I also think that it. we have a female Jedi. I think that just like every kind of male protagonist before them, they all deal with this darkness within them. And I kind of want Rey to also experience this and not just a vision form. Mm -hmm. So that makes me really excited to see. And if it is a vision form, I think that that would be, it's great, but I do kind of want her to experience and embody the darkness and even bring herself back from it, which I think would be powerful. It's something that we've seen come up in novels before, especially in the novel Dark Disciple. Um, and I feel like it could be something that she does because she's so amazing that she could, if she needs something in the dark, maybe she could bring herself there and bring herself back. Yeah, and I think there's that interesting line that Luke says in The Last Jedi of, like, you went straight to the dark because it had something you needed. You didn't even hesitate. And so I think it could be really interesting to see Rey in a position where she actively chooses to go to the dark side because there's something that she needs there and because she knows that she can make that choice to come out of it. So I think it would be really cool to see her actually embody that in real life in the film and not just in a vision or just in possession form. I think it could be really interesting. I want to pull the audience because I don't want to feel alone in what I did after this trailer came out. How many of you, like me, played this like two second clip over and over and over and over and over and over? Now they have, I got a GIF form of it, so I just watched that on repeat. <laughs> I've, I've watched this, you know, countless times and I, maybe this is looking too deeply, but it is very reminiscent of just the, the sort of distortion in the video. Uh, that is apparent when Luke goes into the cave on Dagobah. Mm -hmm. it, just, it just has that feel of it. And I love the idea, I, I don't know where her path takes her, but I love the idea, as Caitlin said, that this is an extension in some form of her finding something she needs, because think about Luke's pathway. He went into that cave, uh, you know, and, and Yoda's advice was, you know, take only what you need, and he's confronted with Vader. Vader's this symbol of uh, you know, not only his, uh, an obstacle to his own pathway to becoming a Jedi, but this is the, the embodiment of the threat to everybody that he loves and cares for. And so he strikes him down, and then on, on the bridge of the Death Star 2, when they're battling together, you get that peak, I mean, he's all in black, and, and he comes so close to, to embracing the dark side there as he's beating Vader down. And, and I love the idea that in some form or fashion, Rey, whether it's a vision or played out interactions, is gonna have to mirror and confront that choice because I want Rey to continue to have to, to struggle to get to the point where she's ready to take over. Mm. Go ahead. Sorry, I will say, if this is a vision, I would love to see Kylo have a similar vision of him as Ben Solo, the Jedi, the good guy. <laughs> It's. Yeah. I, I, I'd be fine if it were a vision, but I kind of think it's not going to be because I feel like if you're going to show it, it's fine. We're just gonna if you're going to show it <laughs> in the trailer and then it just finds up being like this two second vision thing, people will just be like, oh, well, you just kind of like pulled the rug out from under us. So I, I also want to see her actually battle with this. Uh, but that's why this is just a great thing to put in a teaser because it gets everyone going like, is it this, is it that? I don't know, and we're just talking about it. But yeah. We have so many other characters to talk about. Uh, Finn and Poe, uh, I just kind of lumped them together because they have a shot together. <laughs> but, <laughs> but also because I love them, uh, I still think my favorite part in the sequel trilogy is when they meet for the first time and they're escaping. Like that, and 
when I saw that in The Force Awakens, I was like, oh my god, they did it. Like, this is exactly what I wanted. So I'm excited to see them, along with Rey, on a mission, on adventure together. Mm -hmm. They both had these really pivotal transitional moments at the end of The Last Jedi. Uh, Finn, in going from this sort of natural instinct to run away from problems that, that you know, keeps cropping up, and eventually embracing his role as uh, you know, more of a, a leader within the ranks. And then Poe, and this is something as a, an army officer myself I, I relate to, he's going from this sort of direct, what I would call like a direct action mentality. Like his solution to a problem is to jump in an X-wing and blow something up, right? And that's the mentality of, you know, I'm not uh, uh, Navy or Air Force, but that's a fighter pilot mentality, right? You know that cockpit, he knows the X-wing, and he knows that he can control that space. He's not as familiar with being a leader and having others look to him and making big picture decisions. And that, that's what Leia, not only in The Last Jedi, but if you look at the Poe Dameron comics, again and again, Leia is trying to stress and impart this on him because she knows it's going to be time to pass the torch uh, at some point. And we finally get that moment as he's looking out the hangar bay doors on crate, and Finn is ready to go out and start uh, assisting Luke, guns blazing. And he's like, wait a minute, there's a bigger picture to this, and I've got more of a responsibility here than as a gunslinger or a fighter pilot. And I cannot wait to see him, to see both of them embrace those roles and, and flesh out those lessons learned. Uh, Sky Talkers, what do you guys want to see out of Finn, especially? Because I feel like we have a oh, yeah. similar desire. So who here was at our last, like last year, we were on the same panel for the episode nine speculation. Was anyone here for that? Great. So last year, we, we talked a lot about the Stormtrooper Rebellion that we really wanted, right, for Finn. We think that would be an amazing way to kind of round out his character and his origins as a Stormtrooper that was raised to do only one thing, and he broke out of that mold. I mean, it's just an amazing story. I'm so glad that, they, that we have a character like Finn for that. But um, I don't know if it's going to happen <laughs> anymore. I haven't really seen any inclination in the teasers or anything, but I still think that it would be... I want Finn to find his like his identity somehow more, um, and kind of understand where he came from in his stormtrooper origin, I suppose, and everything that came before that. Yeah, yeah and like the the family that he was taken from that he'll never know. Yeah. One of our favorite theories right now is that Fasana is actually where Finn is from, and so it is this kind of homecoming from him for him, and he gets to be a part of his community that he was taken from and get to know his roots and, and kind of further his identity now and maybe find out what his birth name was too. Um, I think that would be really interesting. But then I, I still think that the Stormtrooper uprising and like Finn being a part of that and showing the other Stormtroopers that, yeah, you don't like you don't have to be on this path. You can make a different choice. I did. Let me show you how. Um, I think it'd be a great way, as we've been talking about, like how Finn found himself in the resistance, but it took a while because in the beginning he was there for himself, like the decisions he was making were for himself and then for Rey. And then the end of Last Jedi, he's finally come to the point where he buys into the resistance, into what he's doing, and he believes in that cause. And so I think it would be really cool for him to try and share that with the stormtroopers and then also to have that new sense of place, hopefully with his found family and then with his like community maybe blood family on Pasana too. And that's such a great like point that's so interconnected and like draws in other stuff that we've seen. And you both have this like great phrase that if you want to know the future of Star Wars, you look to the animation department. And there are connections to this theory that I think make it make sense because uh, big picture, First Order has a lot of ships, a lot of guns, and a lot of people. It's, it's going to be very hard for the resistance in its current state to take them on in direct action. So they're not going to fight toe to toe with them any more than the rebellion could with the Empire. But their entire force is built around this army of folks raised from birth and born and, and trained to do nothing but follow orders, right? And so in Resistance, we see uh, this, there's an episode where a, uh, a First Order stormtrooper uh, gets sort of knocked out and then the main character, Kaz, impersonates him. And Kaz is sort of acting erratic because he's Kaz and he's a spy, right? So he's not doing things that First Order troopers kind of do. And his superiors are like, you need a brain scrape, <laughs> right? That, like, that's what they call it. They're going to, th this mental reconditioning. So the biggest single threat to the First Order isn't some fleet that's going to come toe to toe, although maybe we'll talk about that in a second. But it's a, a rebellion within the ranks, right? Yeah. It's their own troopers questioning orders and, and 
thinking about what they're at being asked to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are so many moving parts right now, even within the first order. You have Hux, who, poor Hux, he's, he just <laughs> wants to be a good first order leader and it's not working out. And then you have Kylo, who's now supreme leader, and obviously Kylo and Hux don't get along, and so there's that tension there, and I'm sure we'll touch on Pride coming in as well. There's just a lot of moving pieces, and it seems like authority is uh, not being handled well within the first order, as far as they're concerned, obviously. We don't want that to happen. <laughs> but yeah, I think coming from within, all these moving pieces, it, the first order is just gonna crumble because no one, there's not one singular leader and they can't agree on things. I don't wanna jump too far ahead, but we, we have the Sith Troopers, we have the Knights of Ren. I think it's totally plausible that we could get a Stormtrooper uprising. And that I, I want it. I that just could did. be the <laughs> dynamic. I, I really want it. Yeah. I just. I don't well, well, the interesting thing about the Sith Troopers, and yeah, we'll talk about them later, but it's like, you know, if stormtroopers rise up, how are we going to distinguish between who's good and who's bad? Yeah. Red ones are bad. Visual White cues. ones are good now. Yep. But I also just love the idea because we've had these white armored faceless troopers through all the trilogies, and now it gives them kind of their own character and their own, their own arc, mm -hmm. and I, I like that idea a lot. But... Let's talk about 3PO. <laughs> uh, Anthony Daniels has talked about how he's just had so much fun on this movie and he's gotten to do a lot. Um, I, don't, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> Anyone have any ideas? I mean, it's so interesting. He has red eyes, like triple zero in the comics. And the evil 3PO? Is that happening? I feel he's like programmed it is. in six million forms of Murder. destruction and torture. Murder. <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> what, well, you did see, there's that clip in the, the D23 trailer where you see this like giant red laser beam causing destruction. I mean, he's got red eyes. And it's right after that shot. <laughs> we, we talk about a, a First Order Stormtrooper uprising being the biggest threat. I honestly think 3PO just saying, I've had enough of this. <laughs> like, no more Mr. Nice protocol he's droid. I think that's the biggest threat. Point. 3PO is the Phantom Menace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I think it's interesting is that Anthony Daniels at the Rise of Skywalker panel at Celebration, he spent a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of time. talking <laughs> about how, you know, no one ever listens to C-3PO, more people should listen to C-3PO, why does no one listen to C-3PO? <laughs> and to me, I'm kind of like, okay, C-3PO is going to do something like pretty important in this film. And kind of my theory right now, I think, is that there's like something that's been locked inside C-3PO, and I'll, like I don't know how to describe it, but almost like it's password protected, and someone says it, and it flips a switch, and we get this, um, and I think, it, I think it's going to be actually really important for whatever they're doing. My favorite, and I don't know that they would do this, because it would be, a, it would be such a payoff moment if you've read the, the Aftermath trilogy of books by Chuck Wendig. But in that book, uh, there's a character that you see on screen, one of the Black Squadron pilots named Snap Wexley. And he has this, as a kid, you, you see him as a kid in the books, um, but he has this reprogrammed battle droid named Mr. Bones. And he has this like personality matrix that can be yanked out and plugged in. And I'll tell you, battle droids may seem goofy in Clone Wars and in The Phantom Menace, but give those books a shot because Mr. Bones is a Banff. Uh, and I love the idea that, that and this would require like some context for audience members that haven't read the books, but I love the idea that Snap comes back into the movie from his mission with Black Squadron, and he's like, hey guys, why don't we repurpose C-3PO to give us a little hand here? And he yeah. plugs in Mr. Bones' uh, personality matrix. Yeah, it. I think he's getting like a battle upgrade here. <laughs> like the matrix? Yes. <laughs> I know Kung Fu. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to give him that upgrade though. <laughs> All right, how about Rose? Because we haven't seen like yeah. any Rose That's in the, the marketing only so shot far. We've gotten from her. Yeah, uh, what do you think her role is going to be in this movie? I think she's going to kind of take more of Poe's responsibility as more of a leader in the resistance. Yeah, I would say I think she's going to take more of Leia's responsibility and kind of. I, we haven't really seen her in any photos on Pisano with the other group. Um, so I expect her to kind of be like manning the fleet, I suppose, back um, in like this photo, you know, I think that we can understand where she is from that photo. Uh, um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I'm a little disappointed because I really wanted Rose to be like with our group on a journey. Um, I love her character. I think she really embodies what Star Wars is about. And I, I feel like 
I hope that she has a bigger role. She did mention, Kelly Marie Tran last week in a D23 mentioned that she had a fight scene. So I'm like, all right, maybe it's more than what we were expecting and they're just keeping it under wraps. I like the idea so that the resistance is effectively, you know, mostly wiped out at the end of the, the Last Jedi. And so they never say her rank, I don't think, but it's fair to assume that she's probably like a private, like junior enlisted. But Rose has, or yeah, Rose has all of these skills. She's technically and tactically proficient. She sees the big picture. I mean, you know, as, as Finn is trying to sacrifice himself in sort of a meaningless fashion, uh, you know, from a tactical sense in terms of the battle, it wasn't going to change anything. Mm -hmm. Rose sees what a mistake this is and comes in and saves him. So I like the idea that she's maybe off screen going to have this field promotion to like, we're, we're going to see like Captain Rose or, or, or Admiral Tico. And she's going to be in charge of, of quite a bit of responsibility. And I love that for her character. There is, um, I can't remember it exactly, but at the end of The Last Jedi, when they get to create, she's the one that gives Poe an update on how, like, what they have left of the fleet, I think, or of their supplies or something like that. So I think it would make sense, considering how many people they don't have left anymore, that she would definitely be promoted into this position of authority. And like you said, she has all the skills and the knowledge to handle that kind of position. So I hope she does get that promotion and I hope we get to see her in action a lot. They certainly have availability. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna try to get us through this a little faster because we haven't even touched on the first order yet and we're almost halfway done and I wanna make sure we get some uh, Q and A's going. But uh, Janna and Zori are two characters that we know almost nothing about. Uh, Zori just, or uh, uh, Kate yes, Kate, Carrie Russell. Carrie Russell. <laughs> I know the Star Wars names. <laughs> I don't know the, the real people names. Uh, she just said that Zori is like uh, an old friend of Poe's with a shady past. Uh, and I don't think we know anything about Janna, mm -hmm. but they both look awesome. Other than she, yeah, she looks amazing and she has a cool bow and arrow and <laughs> the best cape ever. Yes. Th there was some speculation, I would, and I'll pitch this because I don't know that I have a thought on it, about her being. Uh, related to, to one of the characters. Do you guys think that she's connected to somebody or is this somebody new potentially? Well, I I would love if she was Finn's sister, but I'm not sure. And then they teased the whole like Lando's daughter thing. I don't think that's happening. <laughs> I think that was a tease. But back to what I was saying before about Finn and his identity, I want him to find his family. I think that that would be wonderful. I mean, I don't think Ray's going to find her family. So I f if, if we have all these characters who are struggling with like basically an identity crisis, I want one of them to have a happy ending and find their family that they were taken from. So um, I, don't, I don't know if that's going to happen, but I sure would love to see that. Well, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to agree with that and then say to kind of my earlier theory about Finn being from Pisana and then Jana is also from Pisana, so there's that relation there and there's that sense of community and familiarity um, that we could still get even if they're not blood related. Of course, yeah. And we see that one shot in the saga teaser of them together, um, Finn and Jana, on a ship that looks like it was from that fleet shot. Um, so, not sure. For Zori, I, it's... We, we don't know, we, we know Poe's beginning, right? He's born on Yavin 4, his parents fought with the Rebel Alliance at Endor, and certainly we know uh, Poe's sort of history as a New Republic pilot who then defects to the Resistance. But there's a lot of his life that we don't see. And I just love the idea that this was not always, like he, he clearly is not a straight-laced officer uh, in any of the films. He does things sort of his own way, which is the great thing about his character. Uh, I love the idea that he's like, you know, in his teenage years, in his formative years, he's out doing nefarious things. Maybe not illegal things, not, not like Han Solo level, like drug smuggling, but he's out <laughs> doing things. And maybe like Zori is a, you know, a friend, a special friend, a partner uh, from his past. Uh, and he finally made the decision to, to get on the right track and join the New Republic and she's still on that pathway, and maybe there's a little bit of bad blood that has to be dealt with there. <laughs> all right, we're gonna move on, and I'm just gonna, I'm lumping all the legacy characters together so we can move through. So Lando, Leia, and Luke, um, what do we think their roles are gonna look like? Do you think they'll be significant parts of this movie? Like, I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards no. Uh, I think they'll be, especially uh, with the situation with Carrie Fisher, Luke is a force ghost. I think he'll probably be an Obi-Wan role where he just like pops in to be helpful occasionally. Uh, and Lando's kind of a wild card. Yep. 
I'm with you. I'm still really confused. If you guys have seen the Vanity Fair photos that came out with The Rise of Skywalker, um, there, that issue a couple months ago, there was a shot of Luke in like a fiery, yeah. What is this? He doesn't look ghostly. He's in his outfit from The Last Jedi. I'm so confused by this. <laughs> and I just, I don't know. I, I feel like maybe we're gonna, we're gonna get some flashbacks with him. I also yeah. think that's just the nature of the the shoot. I know that's <laughs> the not other thing. Like, like, fire cool. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it just looks cool, but I'm still confused by yeah, it. No, there's got to be meaning. Yeah, <laughs> meaning. Yeah, I think Leia. I think Leia will be a big part of the rise of Skywalker. Like her presence will be talked about a lot, even if she can't physically be in scenes because of how they've discussed how they're using cut scenes from The Force Awakens. So I'm really interested to see that. But I think that she will be a big part of it, like her character in general. And then I kind of think the same about Luke, that he's going to be flashbacks, force goes somewhere in between. And then I'm not really sure about Lando. Um, I, I don't think he's going to be around as much, but he's definitely going to, he's, he's going to bring something important to the resistance I think that they need. I think he might be bringing all those ships. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think sense. he might come in and hopefully help flesh out the fleet a little bit because they need it. He's a businessman. Yeah. Also, maybe a warlord. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I want a moment where he comes into the Falcon's cockpit and just has this sort of like funny moment with like looking up and talking to Han, like I got her back. Yeah. <laughs> Fair and square. Oh. <laughs> 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 but. But he's out there, right? And so Leia put her signal out to the to, to their allies. Uh, Black Squadron, a piece of them are off screen. You don't see a lot of the pilots because they're out on missions uh, looking to make connections with similar allies. And I love the idea that, that uh, Lando, you know, by some probably like slightly illegal way has <laughs> the means to, to come in and help them and then you know seeing him in sort of that leader role like step back into it would be really neat. Yeah. All right, let's get to the first order and talk about the one main character we haven't yet. Little Kylo. Ooh, <laughs> Kylo. Uh, I want to open up with him and the mask because I love what you guys have to say about that. When I first saw that, oh, they're bringing the mask back, I felt like that was a step in the like a backward direction for him, but uh, the Charlotte and Caitlin have some really interesting thoughts about that. So the mask has a really interesting design, and for me, when I first saw it, it reminded me of this Japanese technique called kintsugi. Um, I won't pretend to be an expert in it, but kintsugi is this way of mending ceramics in ancient Japan where they would basically put the ceramics back together and then highlight the cracks with gold and silver. And it kind of turned into a practical thing of repairing the ceramic, but then also this philosophy of like your scars and your tragedies, like you shouldn't hide those away. You should acknowledge them and they are part of your story. And in the end, you have something that is almost more beautiful than when it was pristine and whole. And so for to see that kind of represented in Kylo's helmet, I think there are a lot of questions about Kylo's helmet, like one who put it back together, who wanted it back together, if he actually ever does wear it because we haven't seen him outside of like imagery actually wearing it. It, it is interesting that we see it being rebuilt in the movie and yeah. not like right after The Last Jedi. Yeah, exactly. So who, who collected all these pieces from the elevator where he smashed it? <laughs> um, or does he just have a backlog of them? I don't know. He but would. <laughs> <laughs> for me as someone who sees Kylo as getting redeemed, I think this plays, the Kintsugi helmet plays really well into where I think the sequel trilogy is going as far as this theme of there's darkness and there's light and all of us, you're not one or the other and you shouldn't have to hide the bad things that you've done or that have happened to you. You can take all of that with you as you move forward into being a better person. And that's really what Kintsugi is about. And so this imagery I think ties right back into that philosophy. And given how much that Star Wars is uh, inspired by East Asian philosophies, um, I think this makes a lot of sense that they would pull in this kind of imagery too. All right, let's talk about Ben Dimption. <laughs> Is it who who thinks it's happening and who doesn't? Show of hands. <laughs> okay, well, we got to convince more. Yeah, 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 Charlotte's yeah. About that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, I, I think it probably is going to happen now. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a year ago I said I didn't think that because he's had two chances, and I feel like the climax of every movie is like 
what decision is Ben Solo going to make? Is he going to kill Han or not? Well, he killed him. <laughs> is he going to kill Snoke or Rey? And th like, that's just the most intense part of the movie for me, so I'm excited to see what challenge gets put in front of him in 9. Also, I think Avatar The Last Airbender changed my mind because <laughs> Zuko is such a similar character and I just like, he gets so many chances to do the right thing and I was just shaking him like, just do it once! And <laughs> he finally does and it's so like nice, it's such a relief. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the idea that he is, and, and this builds off your point about the, uh, the mask in a way, Kylo is Kylo's always been conflicted. I think he's at max conflicted level at the end of The Last Jedi. He's got so much rage built in him. And I just love that shot of him pushing forward on the accelerator on that on his TIE fighter because you could just see him gripping it so tightly, so angry, uh, still at Ray. And you know, certainly his mask does not hold happy memories for him. At the last time the moment that caused him to smash it is being called, uh, Snoke calling him a, a child in a mask. And uh, I like the idea that, that there is a bigger force, some, some maybe that we'll talk about in just a second, that's gonna <laughs> cause him to see finally the bigger picture and that he's gonna dovetail with Rey to be part of uh, you know, what we were talking about with the, the meaning of the Rise of Skywalker title. When you bring back Palpatine, you no longer have Kylo Ren being the biggest bad. Yeah. Um, there's a uh, there's like a lot of reasons why I think this is happening, but I, I feel like I don't want Leia to be sad, and I feel like uh, Leia's in the Force Awakens, bring my son, bring her son home. You know, there's still light in him. I know it. At the in the Last Jedi, she loses hope, but then Luke says, "No one's ever really gone," and I feel like we we can't ignore those lines. I, it's, I feel like it's happening. <laughs> I think there's a lot to say. Obviously, a lot of us here have a lot of opinions about Kylo Ren and his redemption. For me, I think it makes the most sense when you look at this like nine-part story. Because, and we've talked, like the uh, first trailer that we saw at Celebration, it was a direct callback to The Phantom Menace. And you know, The Phantom Menace began with a mother's sacrificial love to let her son go. And I think it would be really great to come full circle to have a mother's overwhelming love to welcome her son back. And I think that would be really powerful. And as well, and also, you know, this is the Skywalker saga. And like Alex mentioned earlier, the sequel trilogy is almost like the legacy of the Skywalkers. And I think, you know, in like 10 years, if you have a kid who's just watching Star Wars and he watches it one through nine, and you track for 40 years with this family, and for it to ultimately end in tragedy with Kylo and him not being redeemed, I don't really know what that says about Star Wars. Um, to follow this family all the way and then for it ultimately to end in darkness. Um, for me, that's not a happy ending. And like I said before, I think that like the rise of Skywalker sounds very triumphant. And I think Skywalker can take on a lot of different names, but Kylo is still our Skywalker. So I think that it has to have a triumphant ending for him too. Yeah, and I, you know, uh, his arc, his, his entire goal is to, to fulfill whatever he thinks Vader's legacy is, right? And I refuse to believe that this uh, nine-part saga ends with Vader, uh, even if Kylo is defeated, with Vader's legacy having overcome uh, the light in Anakin, in, in Ben. Uh, because like it or not, I, you know, Ray's a centerpiece of this story, but, but uh, Kylo is a, a complementary part of that, and mm -hmm. he's obviously a big part of the Skywalker family, so I think he's coming back. There's this really, and I know we have to move on, but there's this really interesting thing that I saw online that someone brought up about you know, Yoda's line to Luke in The Last Jedi, you have to pass on what you've learned. You have to teach from your failures to the next generation. And that's what Kylo needs to do. He needs to be able to teach the next generation, like, this is where I messed up. This is how far I fell, but I was able to come back. Let me show you how. Because no one taught Kylo, because Anakin was gone, and Luke and Leia and Han hid that truth from him. And so, in a way, he was kind of isolated in his fall. Um, obviously, there are a lot of decisions that he was making and the pressures from other people and forces with Palpatine, like who knows what's going on there, um, and Snoke, but there was no one there to teach Kylo the truth of his family in a way that would have been most beneficial to him, I think, growing up. And so, he needs to be able to pass on what he has learned so that it doesn't happen again. Okay, we got to talk about the Knights of Ren real quick and then Palpatine. I want to try to do that in like 10 minutes so that we can do 15 minutes of Q&A. But yeah, Knights of Ren, they're finally here. <laughs> there we go. So what do we think they are? Where have they been? 
Um, yeah, <laughs> we, we know almost nothing about them. Uh, I've always liked the idea that they are not force users. Uh, they're, I, I thought that they were hinting that they were um, from the Acolytes of Beyond and the Aftermath books, uh, and that they were just kind of like dark side enthusiasts. Uh, and then uh, Ben Solo comes printed. along. Yeah, Ben Solo comes along, and they're like, "Oh, it's Darth Vader's grandson. He can obviously be the leader of the Knights of Ren." Uh, but who knows? So they're fanboys of the ultimate fanboy. Yeah. <laughs> that I, makes sense to me. I mean, I, uh, I I always get a little concerned when <laughs> there's like so many new characters added each time where I'm like, I, I just want to spend time with our core, basically like five or six characters that have been introduced. Um, so I do hope that this somehow furthers Kylo's story um, and we see his sort of relationship with them, which I think will be really interesting if he has sort of, if he's a master of the Knights of Ren, what does that even look like? Kylo as a master is strange to me. I feel like it's just <laughs> a little dubious. So I, I want to see that in action. I, I think that they're probably going to play a role similar to the Praetorian Guard. Yeah. Like they look awesome, but they're not going to have characters. They're not going to take off their masks and introduce themselves. It's just <laughs> one no awesome fight that. scene. <laughs> My only question is, Luke tells Rey that uh, Kylo destroyed the temple, but that he disappeared with several of his students. And he said he had 12 students. We have, what, six, five, six Knights of Ren that we've seen. My only concern is that we, this movie's not going to be 18 hours long as much as I would love it to be. <laughs> and we can't, they can't gum up the works with this entire backstory that they really haven't told for two movies. So I think we're going to see a slice of them. But I because of time constraints and storytelling constraints, I don't think it's going to be a significant thing. Yeah. I, I hope we see them in battle, because that would be a big letdown yeah. if they're, if they're built up like this and then we don't see them. They're actually accountants. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kylo, it's it's April. April. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get to the Death Star and Palpatine. and we're just, Let's just lump it all. Palpatine, the fleet that we've seen, but I figured we'd focus on Palpatine. Oh. How is he going to return? What's this look like? <laughs> I really don't want it to be a clone. I really don't like that from Star Wars Legends. No. I don't like, I like clone troopers. I don't like clones of our main characters. I think what we've been talking about recently on the channel is that maybe he's been somehow haunting the remains of that Death Star. Like his essence got trapped there somehow. <laughs> Or he's haunting the Vader mask somehow, and it's actually been Palpatine speaking to Kylo through the mask the whole time and not Vader. I think that makes sense. I mean, we know that Vader's no longer Vader. It's Anakin. Yeah. So we see his ghost at the end of Return of the Jedi. So what is going on with that mask? So show me again the power of the darkness. What is that? To me, bringing back Palpatine, um, I don't, it, just, it just makes sense. It was one of those things that really honestly took Caitlin and I both by surprise or we're like, wow, that just absolutely makes sense. There is no greater evil in Star Wars than Palpatine. He is so maniacal, he is so um, crafty. The entire Clone Wars is all crafted just by him and just to make all these different forces, good and bad, go up against each other in an ultimate battle that doesn't even matter because all he is doing is getting power. So when this, the finale of the Star Wars saga of course Palpatine has to be involved. He is the ultimate Phantom Menace. And I think, what, what does he tell Anakin there at the opera in Revenge of the Sith? He says, all who seek to gain power are afraid to lose it. That is at the core of his essence, right? So his entire purpose in life is not just to, to rule the galaxy, right? That's a neat uh, you know, added bonus, mm -hmm. but it's to perpetuate himself. He killed uh, his master he's not going to be killed again and we see this not not just mere this this uh, quest for eternal power in palpatine uh but this this idea that that life can go on beyond life uh is an idea that flows through every bit of star wars i mean you know qui-gon uh worked and worked to try to train and, and retain his essence in the living force didn't complete his training before he was killed on naboo passes on, as you see in the Clone Wars, in the, uh, the Lost episodes, gets Yoda to, to complete his training so that Yoda can, can uh, you know, retain his essence in the living force. And even Yoda, who knows so much, is like, this is impossible. No, no person, no force user 
can live on uh, and, and retain an essence in the living force. But we've seen, at least in Qui-Gon, this idea that you, you, you can be incomplete, right? So Palpatine's work could be incomplete. And I love the idea that he almost got there and whether it's the, the you know some Sith relic uh, or or the Death Star itself, he's there and uh, controlling things. I, I did want to ask you, Thomas, quickly. Um, what are the legal ramifications of a, a long dead leader We're, just coming back and controlling a new government? What? Forty-five minutes of this movie is going to be Palpatine in. Uh, a state court trying to get all his stuff back. <laughs> JJ is got like the mystery box is going to open. It's going to be like, oh, it's a legal drama, haha. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are so many moving pieces with Palpatine, and like everyone has said, once you realize that it's Palpatine who's coming back, it's like, oh, of course, <laughs> like of course it's Palpatine. He is the biggest bad of the Star Wars saga, and he's the one who has been haunting the Skywalkers for. Literally, gen literally generations. Um, one of the things that we talk a lot about on our show is the Last Jedi novelization, where they talk about Palpatine's contingency plan, where basically Snoke has knowledge of basically everything that Palpatine has hidden away, like to save for a rainy day, basically, <laughs> which is kind of what it seems like is happening here. But then as far as like what, I, I don't know how I think he's actually going to appear if it is like possession of a Sith relic or like his essence in the Death Star, like that's really spooky. Um, or if it is a force ghost or he even comes back completely physical, that would be r crazy. Um, but we've kind of talked about animation before too. And there's this great arc in Rebels where it's called The World Between Worlds. I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with that. <laughs> Ooh, Rebels. <laughs> Um, but in this world between worlds, it's uh, basically a timeless place, like time doesn't exist there. And the main character of Rebels, Ezra, he basically is able to change events that have happened already in the past. It sounds freaky, but it's really great. But Palpatine tries to access that kind of sacred space in order to be able to change the past himself. And I think that goes back to him trying to seek the power to prolong life and save people from death, really just save himself from death. And so I think that that kind of freaky force stuff is what he's doing here. And actually the imagery on the Rise of Skywalker poster is very reminiscent to how we see Palpatine represented in World Between Worlds. So I think that that's going to play a big part in how he actually is able to come back in the Rise of Skywalker in whatever form that may be. Do you have a picture of this, uh, the Star Destroyer? Yeah, I was going to say, you mentioned the, his the conting conting yeah. contingency <laughs> plans. Uh, that might be one of them. So cool. <laughs> so if you look, clo well, maybe not even all that closely, those are not First Order Star Destroyers. Those are Imperial class Star Destroyers, right? And if you know anything about the contingency plan, Palpatine for years had been orchestrating, uh, mapping a way into the unknown regions, so this space beyond the known Star Wars galaxy including using Thrawn and the Chiss to, to help uh, effectuate those, those maps. And at the end of Return of the Jedi, in that like a five year space between when Jedi ends and when the Battle of Jakku happens, he's got this select group of Imperials that get this, uh, this really eerie message from these creepy robots with Palpatine's face. And they're instructed to, to get out of Dodge and go to a couple nebulae. Uh, and there's this shadowy figure named Rex, uh, Rax that's, that's orchestrating this whole thing on his behalf. And so, in this, again, go read the Aftermath books, but a, one quarter of the Imperial fleet is unaccounted for, cannot be accounted for to include Palpatine's own flagship uh, Super Star Destroyer. I would love if in the middle of, you know, the, the First Order versus the Resistance, if the Imperial Remnant comes in and they're like, you guys have taken what this this great thing and just messed it all up and then you know part of what saves the resistance is this battle between the imperial remnant forces maybe with Thrawn I don't know and uh, these force, first order flunkies It'd be amazing all right I want to get to some Q and A now uh, so go ahead and start lining up but while people line up I figured let's just do like one real wild wish list thing for episode <laughs> oh, no. nine like mine is I want I want the fireball to be in it. <laughs> kind of like the ghost in from, Rogue One. From Resistance? In Resistance, yeah. Like, you just have the fireball flying. You can have Kaz's voice over the intercom. You don't have to show him. Mm -hmm. J but just, like, little Easter egg like that I think would be great. Yeah. Uh, I want to see Kylo Ren do some seriously crazy Force stuff. 
I want Ezra Bridger to return from this beyond <laughs> that he's, he's gone off to. And I thought he was DJ. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And, and come and help, uh, help the resistance fight it out. I think I'm going to have to take from Resistance as well, and I would really like to see the Colossus. That's my favorite ship ever, and I want to see that in Resistance, or in uh, Rise of Skywalker. And then the Fireball can come out of it, too. It'll be great. Yeah. Um, I really want World Between Worlds, kind of the weirdest Force stuff that you've ever seen, ever, in the Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm wondering, what do you guys make of the long-standing theory that Palpatine's coming back because he's long time been jealous of the Skywalker hair, and now he finally steals it from Kylo Ren, and Kylo, who's already dealing with his conflicted uh, feelings, that's the last straw after he becomes Baldo Ren, uh, and he joins Rey and the Resistance. What do you all make of that theory? Sit down. I knew it was you. <laughs> we won't entertain it. It checks out. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'm Lu- oh, sorry, Le- Leia, Lando, Chewy, R2, 3PO. Of those five remaining legacy characters, which one do you dread most will bite it? Morbid. <laughs> I think they're all fine. Yeah. I, definitely not uh, Chewy or 3PO, and I don't think R2 either. I think, you know, they're so marketable <laughs> and they can be around for literally forever. So I don't think they're going anywhere. Uh, I think I dread seeing Leia die on screen yeah. though. I don't, I don't it's, think it's too close, yeah, so. I I, I, Lando would be my closest guest, but I, I agree, I don't want to see any of that happen. Mm-mm. I'm not emotionally prepared for any of this, and so yeah. I'm going to be going Same. to Costco the day before this movie comes out and getting an industrial case of <laughs> Kleenex that I will bring with me for any tragedy that befalls us. It's going to be a lot of tears either way, I think. So I've been having this theory on the, um, the Imperial fleet myself. I've been thinking it's more like a Dark Force rising, old school expanded universe where they're all pretty much defunct, there's no troopers on them, and it's kind of like the Resistance has found the fleet, and it's a race against time to try to get the fleet before the Forced Order has. What are your thoughts on that theory? We, we actually were talking about that last night, just in our hotel room, that, like, <laughs> yeah, what if it's like the Katana fleet? And, I mean, the Resistance has nothing now. They need all the help they can get. What if, yeah, they're seeking old Imperial warships? To, to use against the First Order. That uh, would be so cool. Lando's like, I got a bead on a couple ships yeah. that might work out for us. You can see like this red stripe on them, which I guess at first I was like, oh, Sith Troopers Sith maybe. Troopers. Yeah. But maybe that's to signify that, no, these are rebel ships. Uh, I do think that could be potentially confusing if First Order <laughs> Triangle ships are fighting old Imperial Triangle ships, like for Do just... You mean tri- triangles? Yeah, it's just like, what's going on, but... <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so there's one uh, aspect of the title that I don't think anybody's been talking about. Rise from the Dead, okay? Yeah. My prediction is going to be they're going to need to go into the Warp in the West, or, or, or I'm sorry, the Warp in the Force that uh, Caitlin mentioned, or some other sort of Force Nexus, go in there to grab Luke Skywalker, and the problem is going to be not getting Palpatine out as well. So, mm-hmm. so you're saying we're getting Luke back uh, resurrected? Yes, because Luke has not fulfilled his arc. If you think Luke was cranky when Ray tried to get him off of the <laughs> when you pull him out of Just, yeah, 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 when you pull him out of his forced slumber, he's going to be real upset. I think we'll see resurrection, uh, someone coming alive from the dead. I just don't think it's going to be Luke. I, I don't think Luke will be resurrected either, but I do like the idea that Palpatine comes out as a consequence of something they were trying to do that was good. Yeah. And oops. <laughs> So the uh, the main goal of the rebels was to turn the citizens of you know the Imperials to their cause. So I was just wondering, what do you guys think the Resistance how they're going to do that in this new movie? You know, is uh, is Kylo going to be a bad leader? You know, or maybe you know plot twist he's actually a good leader and they you know like having him be their leader. You know, which 
how do you think they're going to turn these people, you know, from the Imperials to, you know, the Resistance? I don't think Hux is going to ever think that Kylo's a good leader. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I think he's going to be a terrible leader. <laughs> yeah. in, in the, like, ten minutes we saw of him being Supreme Leader at the end of The Last Jedi, he was n not making great choices uh, from like a tactical standpoint, I think. <laughs> it's a little confusing because then you watch The Force Awakens and you hear those kind of side comments that he makes to Hux about like, maybe we should create a clone army. Your your army isn't, you know, your, your troopers aren't trained or, I don't know, maybe, maybe they might like pull the rug underneath us and Kylo might actually be a little bit more disciplined than we think and then Hux will get mad at that. I don't know. Well, we saw that picture of Hux and Pride, Pride. so yeah. we don't know anything about his character yet. Yeah, I love the, the idea that, uh, so his name is Allegiant General Pride, right? And if you look back in history, I love the idea that the First Order has an element, a political element to it, or a loyalist element to it that we just haven't seen yet. And if you look back in history, like the Soviet Army in World War II had these like political commissars. So they're, they're loyalty officers, political officers effectively, whose job it is to keep order within the ranks. So they're not out on the front lines necessarily pulling triggers, but if you're talking bad and questioning what the, the uh, USSR is doing, they're gonna report on you and, and that sort of stuff. I love the idea that the First Order has this to try to keep this ship together, especially after uh, what happened at the end of Last Jedi. So there is a new droid, obviously, called Dio. Yeah, Dio! And uh, how do you think he or she is going to come into play and Whose droid do you think they are? I think he belongs to Lando. Hmm. I, I, I think I read somewhere that it's like almost BB-8's droid. Like yeah. The BB <laughs> he just, I think it's like Dio follows BB-8 around like a duckling. Well, <laughs> well, yes. In the concept art for Dio that they showed at Celebration, they literally had a rubber ducky as like the beginning of the concept art. So you have, I think that there's like some sort of imprinting maybe that happens <laughs> with BB-8 and, and Dio. I don't know, but Dio has to be important somehow. I mean, he he's would, adorable. He so. would just, I think it'd be really cute if he was Rose's droid and yeah. he just like scurries around after her all the time. <laughs> Um, my question is, so when you look at Dark Ray and you see her lightsaber, it almost has the same like crackly properties that Kylo has. Yep. So if it's not a force vision and just like a coincidence or whatever, do you think that she took his kyber crystal? Do you think that she like modified his blade in some way? I would say that I think that since it's a double-bladed lightsaber, maybe it's the two crystals that she has at the end of uh, The Last Jedi. And the whole thing about Kylo's crystal is that he... He tried to uh, kind of improperly make the crystal bleed, and that's why it is all craggly. I feel like maybe that's the same thing. And going back to what I said before about like maybe she has to force herself to go to the dark and knowing that she can come back, the way that I would link that is that then she's forcing that crystal also to bleed, and because she's not fully dark, it wouldn't be completely um, a clear saber. I mean, it might be unstable because it's been busted in half already. True, <laughs> that too. I mean, we, we love the jagged Can you super glue kyber crystals? <laughs> One of you two pointed out right after the, the trailer dropped that uh, it's the hilt is very reminiscent of Temple Guard's mm -hmm. hilt. So it is not the first time we've seen a folding lightsaber, but it is, it is like to a T, it looks like uh, a Temple Guard's lightsaber. Yep. Yeah, which that episode is also very tied to World Between Worlds. Okay, so in one of the scenes from the newest trailer scenes we have, she throws her lightsaber and when she catches it again, she's got that red ribbon on her mm. wrist. Speculation has it that that's the mark of a Jedi Master. Mm. What are y'all's thoughts on it? We have a theory about the red string of fate, which is a concept that's used to link soulmates together, also from like Asian philosophy um, and like their folklore. And we think that that is furthering the connection between Rey and Kylo because they are so connected to one another and it's just kind of a visual cue for that too. So I wouldn't, right now I wouldn't be surprised if they trade that back and forth or if Kylo has some other kind of red symbolism. Which he does possibly, in his Yeah, helmet. possibly through his Kitsuki helmet. Um, that is just kind of a visual cue of their connection. The Red String of Fate theory goes back even to during the production of The Last Jedi, uh, Ryan Johnson tweeted a thread of just uh, pieces red, red. of red thread <laughs> and then deleted them. Um, so it's always like, what is 
that. And then in The Last Jedi, there's all these lines, there's all these red, there's all this red imagery and, you know, tied on, tied on the end, tied on the end of a string, indeed, General Hux, always makes me think that there's just something about tied strings. It could be really interesting, though, like if they took the red string of fate, but then also made it that kind of mark of the master. Yeah. And then we'll see that like at the end of the film, too, for Rey and possibly for Kylo, too. I would love it if it's a piece of Snoke's curtains that she grabbed. <laughs> oh, my gosh. She I just, love She that. just tells Kylo, like, you remember when I got you? That would be amazing. <laughs> Souvenir. <laughs> How plausible do you guys think it is for Hux to kind of work with the Knights of Ren to overthrow Kylo and possibly even cause the Stormtrooper uprising thing? I will say that this has to be our last question. We've got one minute left. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. I, I feel um, that's totally possible. I, I think that that look at the end of The Last Jedi that Hux gives um, Kylo as he's like kneeling super depressed on the ground, um, I think that it's very indicative to me, it's like super clear that Hux is going to try to upstage Kylo in some way, stage a coup, I don't know. And involving the Knights of Ren just kind of makes sense because they're super awesome looking. And the fact that they've been gone for an entire movie, they could come back and not be on Kylo's side. True. Yeah. All right, well, thank you guys for <laughs> your you. questions. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you.